Stories, fables, ghostly tales. A boy feels lonely and has felt so all of his youth until he meets Amy, whose eyes light up the darkest parts of his life, and Lily Madrip takes a trip to the hospital for her scheduled MRI, where she meets a person more weasel than man, at least in her eyes. Welcome listeners to your dose of unique stories written by unique and creative people just like you. Our first story is a short tale written by Arleaf Shiro Yang, titled Amy Bright Eyes. And our second story is by Lillian Madwip, titled My Name is Lily Madwip, and There's Nothing Wrong With My Brain. Right now, I'm drinking a Melbourne black tea, which is a nice mix between Russian caravan and an earthy bitterness of good old black tea. So nice. Pour yourself a lovely tea. Turn the lights off, the sound up, and join me for two unique stories. Amy's Bright Eyes When I was a kid, I had this friend whose name was Amy. I really can't recall anything that can describe her, but she had these eyes that were so bright, you won't be needing a flashlight in the dark. We played a lot of games, and after, my mum said that we'll put the lights off as a sign for me to go to sleep. But I can't, because Amy was sitting at the edge of my bed, begging me to play with her again. Her bright eyes always caught my attention, and I always wondered, how? She liked to run around my room and circled me. Her eyes made me smile. A pure bliss of warm love and happiness. You see, no one really liked to play with me. But when Amy came one night when I was eight, things became exciting, and the void was filled with sparkling lights and smiles. We played quietly for almost two hours, every night for two years. I was in the grocery store with my mum, buying goodies and stuff. The day before my 11th birthday, When Amy whispered something in my ear, she told me that she has a surprise for me, and that the gift will make everything different. That will make me different. The night after she told me this, I was expecting her to come home and play with me again. I waited for two hours, until eleven, but no sign of Amy's bright eyes. She didn't even come to my party. I was very disappointed by her back then. My only best friend ignored the happiest day of my life. And I just thought about the gift, that maybe she was busy preparing it. That same night after the celebration, I still waited for her in my room, staring at the edge of my bed. My mum came and told me that I needed to go to sleep, because it's already nine. And she put the lights off. I heard her, but it was hard to focus, and mum didn't realise I was sobbing, my back was facing her. I waited till eleven. I was about to sleep, but someone touched my shoulders. I tried to look behind me, but she put her hands over half of my face, saying, Guess who came back? I knew it was her. I tried to look back again, but... Her hands began to claw, began to burrow through my eye sockets. I struggled and tried to get her hands off me, but she was so strong. It was hot as hell. I felt that burning sensation. I cried and cried, but she said that I needed to be quiet or else she will hurt me. It lasted for almost an eternity, and my body succumbed to pain, and I fell asleep. Everything changed when I woke up. Everything. After that night, she never came back, 
and whatever Amy had done to me really helped me achieve my dreams. I am 20 years old now, and half of my life was filled with sadness and isolation. And the void that kept everything from me was destroyed. Because, you know, I was blind for 11 years. This story was written in by Arleaf Shiro Yang. He considers himself a amateur writer, but I gotta say, you definitely have talent. Looking forward to any more stories you have up your sleeves, Arleaf. And thanks for sending this one in. My name is Lily Madwip, and there's nothing wrong with my brain. The old lady at the hospital check-in desk with the crazy curly hair smiles at me. Lily, what a lovely name. Is it with one L or two? What kind of question is that? If my name had one L, it'd be L-I-Y. And I don't even know how to pronounce that. Unless it was Illy. That just makes me sound like I'm sick all the time. Here comes Illy Madwip, the sickest girl in fifth grade. That Illy Madwip makes me puke. I repeat my name for her. She's old. Maybe she doesn't hear too well. Lily. She nods. She's wearing big glasses. Why are her glasses so big? They're like twice the size of her eyes. And she's not even keeping the glasses over them. They're halfway down her nose. That's probably why she has them on a chain. Because they keep sliding down her nose and falling off. Can she even see? Maybe her vision is so bad, she doesn't notice she's not seeing through her glasses. What good are they then? I hope I never need glasses. I'd probably lose them all the time. Yes, dear. I heard you. Do you spell it with one L or two? She says. Why does she keep asking me this? Two, of course. I watch her spell my name with three L's. Thankfully, Mum gets off the phone with her office and takes over. My daughter's name is Lillian Madwip. She's scheduled for an MRI. I walk away to look at the other people in the waiting room. A blonde lady and her son are sitting by the automatic doors that go outside. The boy has a bandage over his right eye. Pascal would be able to tell me why, but Pascal isn't here. I know what's going to happen to the boy though. He is going to see a doctor who is going to take the bandage off and shine a light in his face and then make him lie down and put some drops of medicine in his eye while his mum holds him down and he screams. Then they'll put the bandage back on. Across from them is a man with a weasel face filling out some forms on a clipboard. I've never seen a weasel up close. But I know weasel is also a term used to describe someone with beady eyes and a long face. And this guy has both. So that's a weasel face. Oh, he's looking back at me. I'm just looking at this plant. Wait, I don't think that's a real plant. I thought these plants were here to provide oxygen for people. But they're just here for decoration. Lily, Mum calls. Come here. The receptionist lady has a wristband for me to wear with my name spelled the long way, and my birth date and some other codes that I figure only doctors and nurses know. Mum and I sit and wait. It feels like hours. I try not to pay any more attention to the other people coming and going because this is a hospital. And when I look at the other people, I just know all the unpleasant stuff they're going to have done to their bodies. And it's more than I needed to know. Like ever. Ew. My mum takes a magazine about housekeeping. That's not actually an interest of hers, but she likes to pretend it is. She's probably going to look at pictures of other people's homes, and then silently judge my dad for the ways our home doesn't look like them. And he's there all the time. But he digs up all my dead pets and weeds her garden and writes dirges, so he's not just sitting on his butt all day. I wonder if he's sitting on his butt right now, while we're at the hospital. I flip through a magazine about science. Some photographer got really close to monkeys and took photos of them doing monkey stuff. Apparently, you can get a job just squatting in the jungle, taking pictures of animals. 
I want a job like that. Maybe I'll save up my money and buy a camera and start taking pictures of animals. Or I could be one of those photographers who takes pictures of crime scenes. The monkeys in this magazine story look really happy that this photographer is hanging out with them. I glance up from my monkey article and see the weasel-faced man staring at me from the far corner of the waiting room. He looks back down at his forms, then scribbles some more stuff before taking the clipboard over to the lady with the enormous glasses. I watch him because he's got suspicious written all over him. But then, I see that in a while, he's going to be talking to some doctor in a big white coat like all doctors have, and they're going to go off to an office and talk about grown-up stuff. So I start singing to myself in my head to stop knowing what's going to happen. Weasel Guy turns around and looks at me again. I imagine him with whiskers and then realize I'm staring and remind myself to blink and go back to my monkeys. I guess it's not his fault he was born with a face like a weasel anyway. Eventually, a big lady with really short black hair curls calls us in. She's wearing a green hospital uniform. Mrs. Maddock, we're ready for Lillian. It's Madwimp, I tell her. I put my monkey science magazine back and follow mum and the nurse through the swinging doors. The hospital is like a maze. Halls go down other halls and there's dead ends that are offices and closets. I bet the center of the hospital is where the Minotaur lives. That's a monster from an old story we read about in school. It lived in a giant maze, and people would go into the Minotaur's maze and get lost, and then it would eat them. A Minotaur is like a human, but with a cow for a head. Not a whole cow, just the head. We get to a little room with a bed that's covered in paper because of germs. There's a paper dress folded up on the table. Hospitals love paper. You need to change into this gown, sweetie, the nurse tells me. And any jewelry or metal piercings need to come off. That's because an MRI uses magnets. Mum told me about it before we got here. Big, powerful magnets that will rip any metal right off you. I bet if a minotaur got an MRI, it would pull the metal ring out of its nose. Why do cows get nose rings anyway? Maybe it's only the punk cows. I don't have any jewelry or piercing, so I should be fine. But I bought a bunch of quarters in case things get bad, and I have to pay to the swear jar. They're a little sweaty from me holding them because I got no pockets. Mum's holding them for me. After the nurse leaves, I change into the paper dress and wait on the table, swinging my feet because there's nothing else to do. Mum is quiet, probably because she's worried about the results. She thinks they're going to tell me my head is full of nothing but tumors, but I know that's not going to happen because my head is not nothing but tumors. When do I get Pascal? I ask. Mum looks up. If you behave yourself... When we get home, we'll discuss your toy. I see what she did there. She didn't say I was getting him back when we got home. She said we'd discuss him when we got home. You said I could have him when this is over, not discuss him. We'll talk about it when we get home. I am not going to throw a tantrum. I want to. I want to start shouting about how she's changing her promise. But I know if I start yelling... She'll use that as a reason to not return Pascal to me. This is a test. She's trying to make me upset, to justify not giving him back. I'm not going to do it. So I just stare at her and think the tantrum. Mom stares back. I imagine she's getting the image I'm sending her with my brain, and it makes me smile. She smiles back. The lady nurse in her green uniform returns, and asks my mum questions about my health including whether I'm pregnant. Then she tells me it's time to go. So I give mum a hug because I know she's scared, and follow the nurse down hall after hall, until we get to a huge room where a giant machine is. That must be the MRI. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie, with a table for me to lay on, and get shot into another dimension, through this giant metal donut. Or maybe it's going to turn me into a donut. I would be the worst tasting donut. Probably jelly filled too. I hate jelly filled donuts. If you're afraid of tight spaces, hon, the nurse says, 
it's going to feel a little cramped. But you have to lay still. You're going to get an injection of contrast. Wait, what? Injection? When did needles get involved? Nobody said anything about needles. Can I just drink it? I ask. Oh no, dear. Well, there goes one quarter to the swear jar. She doesn't even remove the needle. She leaves it in my arm. I hate this nurse now. I think angry thoughts and stare at her while I lay on the bed and she wheels over some weird machine with swirly tubes coming off it that she attaches to the other end of the needle sticking out of my arm. Oh god, I can't even look at it. I'm going to gag. In I go. Into the metal donut. I hold my breath and think about Pascal. And Meredith. I wonder what she's doing at school without me today. I hope she doesn't burn anybody. It must be hard not being able to get angry for fear of burning stuff. I'd be burning stuff all the time. My arm feels really warm. I wonder why the lady in black was hanging out at the mall. There's way too much stuff going on all at once. I feel like my head is going to explode. Maybe I really do have a tumor. The MRI machine is super noisy. It sounds like someone banging metal grocery carts around. Dad calls those baskets because they're like a basket and a cart. But mum hates it when he uses that word. I call them baskets when I want to annoy her. Oh my god. How long am I going to be in here? I thought the waiting room was a long time. But at least I had the monkey science magazine to read. I wish there was something to read or watch but there's nothing. Finally, I come out and it's all over. I'm about ready to claw this thing out of my arm, but the nurse pulls it out for me and puts a bandage over the spot. I can see the hole they poked in me. She has me sit in a wheelchair and takes me out into the hall. I can walk. Just relax, she says and then stops, parks my chair off to the side and walks off into what I think is one of the dead end office rooms. Why did she leave me here? instead of taking me back to the room where my clothes are. She didn't even tell me if she was coming back. Am I supposed to do something? I don't even know where I am right now. I feel kinda lightheaded too. Oh no, they found tumors, didn't they? And what are we doing here? Comes a man's voice from behind. I turn my head to see who it is. It's the weasel-faced man from the waiting room. He's looking at me and smiling. I don't know him, so I don't say anything. I blink so he doesn't think I'm staring, and then look back to where the lady nurse disappeared. I can hear him walking over to me because his shoes make a clop-clop sound with each step. He stops right beside me. Lily, Madwip, he says. Don't look back. He probably heard you give your name in the waiting room. I'm sorry. Lillian Alexandra Madwip. What? Oh no. Oh no. He knows my full name. No. That doesn't really give him power over me. That's just a thing I thought about. But how does he know my middle name? Maybe it was written down on one of the forms my mum filled out? I can feel him looking down at me. He's really tall and thin. But all I really notice is he's got boots with pointy toes on because I'm not going to look up at him. I'm just going to stare at this floor, and maybe he'll think I'm asleep or something. Oh right, I just looked at him a moment before. Maybe I have that disease where you just fall asleep suddenly. I could start snoring. Oh, you're not supposed to talk to strangers. My name's Felix. Do you want to know my last name? Maybe I don't have one. Would that surprise you? I am a statue, I am a statue, I am not really here. I know what would surprise you. What if we talked about Pascal? I finally look at him. He grins down at me. Even his teeth look like weasel teeth. I can't help thinking it. His last name must be Weaselman. Felix Weaselman. How does he know? How do I know about Pascal? He glances down the hall. I think he's trying to make sure nobody's coming. He scares me. 
He's reading my mind. What am I thinking now? Potatoes. Just because. Potatoes. Read that, Felix Weaselman. No, I'm not a mind reader. I just know people well. And I know all their secrets. Do you know where Pesca is? I whisper. I'm afraid of speaking in full volume. I don't know why. I almost don't want him to hear me. I just want the nurse to come back and wheel me back to my mum. Mum knows where Pascar is. Felix kneels down next to me and puts a hand on the arm of my wheelchair. Even his fingers look like weasels. Not like weasels, but weasel fingers. Not that weasels have fingers. I guess they do, sort of. But not like human fingers. If a weasel turned human, I think it would name itself Felix Weaselman and start terrorizing little kids at the hospital. Oh no, that must be what this is. I'm sorry, Lily. I don't know where Pascar is, but I know about him and you. You see things before they happen, don't you? Who are you? I ask. He's not a doctor, that's for sure. He's wearing a long coat with fur on the edge of it. I bet it's weasel fur. Oh my god, everything about this man is weasels. I told you, I'm Felix. I'm like you, Lily. He grins his weasel teeth at me. I half expect him to have a long, thin moustache and twirl it with his fingers like in cartoons. I have a gift just like you and a totem that connects me to the divine. I don't know what that means. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a silver locket on a chain. I bet that thing would have ripped right through his coat if he went in the MRI. There's a hook on the side of the piece, and he unlatches it and it opens. Inside is a photo of a boy. He's got short brown hair like someone held a bowl over his head and just cut around the edge. He's smiling, and his teeth kind of look weaselish, even for a kid. This is my son, Joseph. You can call him Joey. Hi, Joey. I say to the boy in the locket. Felix snaps it shut. He can't hear you, unfortunately. He passed away some months ago. He sounds sad as he says this. Kinda like my dad when he talks about Roger. But you know who can hear you, Lily? Raziel. He's my connection to the Divine. What does that mean? He's my angel, like Pascar is for you. Why don't you say hello to Raziel? I say hello to Raziel in my head. There's no response. I look at Felix and he's watching me really closely, like he's expecting me to say something. What kind of angel is Raziel? I ask him. He holds the locket up to my face. Why don't you ask him yourself, Lily? Raziel, are you an angel? I ask the locket. There's no response. Felix stares at me. So, what did he say? What's Raziel the angel of, Lily? I don't know, I whisper. I feel frightened. I don't know what's going on or if anything Felix is telling me is true. He's not talking to me. Maybe this is some secret test my mum organized to see if I really believe in angels. Felix stands up and puts the locket back in his coat. He doesn't talk to me either. Not that he could, but I know that he's there. That's my gift. I know things. Not things like Pascar knows. I can't see the future like you. But I know everything else. I know the things people don't want me to know. I know secrets. I don't have any secrets. I don't think I do anyway. I am an open book. Honestly. I tell people all my secrets and most of the time, they don't even believe me. Felix steps back and I realize just how close he had gotten to me that whole time. It feels like I'm suddenly in an open field with flowers, like yellow flowers. I want to jump up from my wheelchair and run through the flowers. Freedom. That's what it feels like. He was so close. I didn't even realize it was starting to feel like I was being crushed in a can crusher. Lily, the tin can.
No, Lily. You don't like keeping secrets, do you? He says. I'm going to be honest with you too. I'm not from around here. I used to travel all over. Do you like carnivals? Have you ever been on a tilt-a-wheel? Gone to the top of a ferris wheel and looked down? I'm a mentalist. That's a stage performer. Kind of like a magician. Do you like magic tricks? Sometimes. Who doesn't like magic? Boring people and scientists. I would use my gift for knowing people's secrets and to tell them things they had forgotten about themselves. Where they left their keys, that sort of thing. Or maybe they've done something that they didn't want others to know about. Those were fun to reveal. Any secret, I would know it. Like where your brother Roger hid something valuable from you. Oh my god, he knows where Roger hid my foil Charizard? Where? Oh, I don't actually know that, dear. I know that your brother hid something from you. But in order to know where, I'd need to meet Roger. And unfortunately, he's not here, is he? Huh. Rats, where the hell did my nurse go? Anyway, Felix continues, Joey, my son, was an assistant in the show. He was the most wonderful boy. You'd have loved him. Really, he would have believed you about Pascal. Like your friend Jamal, he believed me about Raziel. The heat in my head and arm are going away. I feel a lot more clear thinking. What happened to him? You know what happened to him. Suddenly Felix isn't smiling anymore. I don't know what he's talking about. Did he tell me? And I missed it? Did I read it somewhere? No. Someone told me something. He keeps staring at me. Oh, is he doing that thing I did to my mother? He's trying to send his thoughts into my... Meredith. Meredith happened. Meredith. I say. Felix nods. He looks like he just took a bite of a really nasty sandwich. I think he's trying to suck his weasel teeth into his face or something. Down the hall, I see the nurse finally come around the corner with my mum. I wonder how she teleported from that dead end room to wherever she just came from. They don't seem to notice this tall, thin, weasel faced man hovering over me. Mum, hurry! I came here looking for information on her, Felix whispers. His voice doesn't sound so cheerful anymore. It's almost like he wants to snarl. His teeth are clenched together, and he's saying everything through them. But instead, I found you. You don't have to be afraid, my dear. I'm going to find Meredith. I found her once. I'll find her again. Somebody needs to protect the rest of us from her. He pauses and looks over his shoulder. Do you see somebody? Then turns and smiles at me, but it doesn't seem like a happy smile. There's nobody there. The hallway is empty. I was seeing things before they happen. Again. He puts a hand on my shoulder. It's going to be okay. I'll see you soon. And then he walks off, in the other direction, down the hall and back into the maze where he came from. I'm shaking, and I can't stop. Something about Felix Weaselman terrifies me. It wasn't his weasel face either. It was like I was finally meeting somebody who is crazy. Other kids call me Mad Lily sometimes, especially buttholes like Jeffrey Baker. But they haven't met anyone like Felix. He was so calm and seemed normal, except for the whole part about knowing my secrets. I wonder if that's even true. I wonder if there's really an angel in his locket. And if so, why didn't it speak to me? Mum and the nurse finally show up for real a few minutes later and take me back to my clothes so I can change. I do it as fast as I can so we can get out of here. Mum had put my quarters in her purse. She gave them to me. I tell her she's going to need to keep a couple. In the car, she asks me how I'm feeling, if my vision is fuzzy or anything. I tell her I'm fine. I don't tell her about Felix. I don't tell her about Raziel, 
and I definitely don't tell her about Meredith. I don't know what I can tell her anymore. I need to think about things on my own. What I really need is to talk to Pascal. And I know if I start bringing this stuff up with her, I might not get him back. I just hope that weasel faced guy Felix doesn't go to my school today. At home, Dad is in his workroom. He was probably writing a dirge. He does that. Mum tells me to sit at the dining room table and wait. I wonder what we're having for dinner. Probably something that's going to make me want to vomit. I wonder if I can convince them to order pizza if I tell them that the medicine they injected me with made me feel funny. Mum comes back with Dad and... Pascal! Pascal, where were you? Pascal tells me he's sorry for the things he knows I've had to deal with alone. He says that sometimes we face things alone because we have to, in order to become stronger. He says that, you know, I feel like I'm getting a lecture from my parents. Oh, I am. They're talking too, but I'm not even listening to that, because I'm too busy being giddy to see Pascal again. Do you understand? Dad asks me. I don't. Yes, I tell him. Dad hands me Pascal, and I hug him to my chest. We have a lot to talk about. A big thank you for both writers for today's stories, and I'm looking forward to more stories from both of them. What was your interpretation of the first story? What did you like about it? Let me know in the comments below, and I'm sure the author will be pleased to hear what you have to say. And Felix, well, he's something else, isn't he? I have a theory. Sure, there are gifted people that amplify abilities. In Felix's case, could one such gifted person have the power to dampen another gifted person? Throw it out there, hook, line, and sinker. What do you all think? Let me know. For my podcast listeners out there who are urgent to let me know, shoot me an email at storiesfablesghostlytales at gmail.com. And for my YouTubians, if that's even a word, leave a comment below. If you have a couple of seconds to support the podcast, simply share it with a friend. iTunes reviews are awesome, and sharing with someone you care about is also another way to support the podcast. By the way, I haven't forgotten about shoutouts, so keep an ear out for those. This Wednesday, I'm going to jump onto some creepy pasta, I think, but hand-picked, of course, to shake things up in an interesting way. So, my lovely listeners, write like there's no tomorrow, listen like you've just begun to hear, and immerse yourself in the stories from other worlds. And as always, till next time.